So I want to say thanks to all of you. Welcome. We're glad to have you here. My name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president at CSIS. Um, this is uh, when, when Dr. Lamb proposed having this, this conference, uh, I, I said absolutely. This was the first topic that I ever brought to CSIS when I came. I came back in 2000. I had been at uh, the Defense Department, uh, was the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and uh, was, at the time, we had had long and rather difficult experiences in Bosnia and Kosovo. And I, I can still remember going to Bosnia, and this was in 1997, and talking with the commanders, and the entire conversation was about the challenges of re, of, of Re-establishing civil society. You know, we were we're we're we at the OD, We're pretty good about overthrowing governments. <laughs> we but we don't know how in the world to create new civil society afterwards. Uh, and I can remember this uh, this the, our commanding officer, uh, three-star general, uh, and this remarkable insight he had, which he said, you know, the, I found out the most important thing that we should do to get things going here is we've got to get the schools opened. He said, the reason is, is because moms are the foundation of civil society, and they're not going to uh, abandon their kids unless schools are operational. You know? It was a remarkable insight. It's nothing that a, a DOD guy like me would have ever thought about. And it's one of those insights that you get that's a product of painful experience. We've had, uh, what, 15 years of painful experiences. And we are right now going back into our normal pattern, which is government amnesia. You know, we're going to forget all of this. This tends to be the norm, you know, I'm afraid. I can remember so many times in, in 2000 when, when we were, or 2001, when we were getting ready for the, this uh, invasion of Iraq, we were involved at the time because of work we had done and tried to put in front of them a template. This is what you're going to experience. This is what we learned from this project. And we stumbled our way into it all, all over again. You know, uh, we've now had 10 years of this experience. We've been mapping it. Um, the SIGR, you know, the Special uh, Inspector General, has been documenting all of it. You know, but what's the structure to remember it? You know, and how do we make it part of us? You know, this is uh, what our fear is that we're going to this amnesia is going to take over, and we, you know, we, we ought to try to save ourselves making mistakes one more time. So, uh, fortunately, we found two really very important partners to help us with this. Uh, Arthur Keyes, uh, I have to tell you, the most remarkable meeting I ever had, first meeting I ever had with somebody with, with, with Art Keyes, we were going to have breakfast over at the Metropolitan Club, and he, he shows up with a dozen eggs. I said, well, they have them here, you know. <laughs> uh, you know? But he, he, he has, he, it's a micro, uh, uh, he's a micro farmer. He's got his own chickens, and he showed up with, and it's, but it, it grows a bit out of his spirit. This is a remarkable man. He's, he created IRD. Um, and in the last 30 years, it has distributed almost $2 billion of humanitarian assistance. I mean, talk about uh, a remarkable organization and a remarkable set of accomplishments. And it's, it's done by uh, ingenious concepts of development. Uh, uh, so w when we started talking about this, and he said, yes, we would be willing to help with something like this, uh, it really gave life to the idea and, and David Wall is with us from ACOM. Uh, he's the International Development Senior Vice President at ACOM. Um, deep and long experience uh, in Iraq. Uh, was it with USAID, I think, for seven years. Uh, and was actually one of our experts in, on uh, economic development and finance development. And so ACOM said, yes, we're interested in this too. Uh, we, need to, we, we need to still harvest what we can learn from this experience. And these are two organizations and two gentlemen. 
that uh, are committed to doing that. And so that's what we're going to do today. And all of you are we're very important to have you here for this. So I want to say thank you to all of you for coming, and thank you to these gentlemen for, for coming. Arthur, let me just start with you. Let's, let's open this up for real, and uh, would you please welcome Arthur Keyes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, my only correction to your comments is we're only 15 years old, not 30 years old. So. But I want to thank you uh, for your remarks this morning and for helping IRD and AECOM to uh, co-sponsor this important conference. We began this idea of the conversation that John and I had some time ago. Uh, and it's great being here today to see everything uh, coming into uh, fruition. Uh, John has a direct uh, experience of these uh, knowledge of the importance of stabilization from his years of service at the uh, Defense Department as well as CSIS. So we thank you for hosting us today. Let me thank uh, Robert Lamb and the very uh, competent CSIS team uh, focused on crisis, conflict, and cooperation for making this conference happen as well, including uh, Joy Owen and Catherine Mixon and many others that have been working on this. I'd also like to thank AECOM, uh, our co-sponsor today and our partner in several international programs in the developing world. David Wall has shown great leadership and foresight and we're privileged to work together uh, with him and AECOM. We undertake this conference at a key moment with so much happening in the developing world that challenges U.S. foreign policy. From instability and transition problems in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran, to Libya, Egypt, Syria, and other Middle East issues, to Mali, Niger, Chad, Burkina Faso, and West Africa, from Sudan and South Sudan, Somalia and Yemen, to political transitions in Burma and North Korea, or to the presence of large numbers of internally displaced persons in Colombia. The international community is faced with a host of complicated and dangerous decisions to protect and facilitate stability and help advance strategic interests that will lead to peace, economic growth, and reduction in world poverty. We're glad that CSIS entitled this conference Rethinking Civil Civilian Stabilization and Reconstruction because that's exactly what we need, a rethink. We now have a lot of experience from the Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Africa for us to look objectively at what has worked and what has not worked as well as we would like to, to have had. Of course, every political and social situation is different, and we have different historical backgrounds. But there are many common themes that we need to explore and see how we can do a better job in unstable situations that are bursting forth all around us. We need a rethink that is focused both inwardly, probing our civilian-led stability, instrumentation, and effectiveness, as well as externally, focused on how host nations perceive and benefit from these activities. What lessons can we learn? From the breakup of the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s to Yemen and Somalia today, fragile states pose security and financial threats to the entire international community. Yes, there is a strong track record of success by civil society groups in helping stabilize such societies by protecting vulnerable people, building resilience against renewed conflict, and rebuilding economic and governance institutions. Recent civilian stabilization successes can be traced to efforts launched by IRD and other international and local NGOs in the Balkans in the 90s, where civil society groups became critical partners in sustaining the peace and laying the groundwork for solid economic and social development. Since we're talking about the real world, it is fair to say that some civil societies, economies, and sovereign governments have developed differently in the Balkans. 
all are at peace today. Most economies have grown, and the civil society has continued to flourish. The stabilization programs, the community revitalization through democratic action program we did in Serbia, started out with quick impact. And then it moved to local government programs. And then on as, as, the, as the government and the, and the economy began to take off into straight economic development programs. It was a continuum. And I think today we can look at the Balkans in Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Kosovo, Macedonia, and Montenegro and see significant progress in all of those countries. In Bosnia-Herzegovina, it's a mixed bag. Yes, there is peace. Yes, the civil society does exist. But there is a weak function, functioning or non-functioning government, and the economy is dormant. At the same time, two of the states of the former Yugoslavia have entered the European Union, Croatia and Slovenia. IRD and other NGOs are now applying similar community-based models of development in other conflict and post-conflict zones, including West Africa, Yemen, and Afghanistan. A relatively new development is that NGOs and donors now cooperate and coordinate directly with U.S. and international security forces. In places like Iraq and Afghanistan, the coordination has been so close that NGOs' work has been viewed as a key pillar of effective counterinsurgency, particularly in the build phase of COIN's clear hold build strategy. Both military and civilian leaders repeatedly point out that civilian agencies are often better equipped to understand and work directly with local communities. They are generally better received by local governments and populations. While some development organizations say such partnerships compromise their political neutrality, beneficiaries recognize the congruency with the NGO community's mission to assist vulnerable populations, especially those caught in armed conflict. IRD believes that the vulnerable populations cannot wait until all of the ideal conditions are present for development. In fact, our experience shows that social development and economic growth are key elements that speed the securing of stability, peace, and long-term development. We have learned that it is important to bring in civilians early. According to one of our government U.S. government civilian counterparts in Afghanistan, even before the initial clearing operations in Argandop had concluded, uprolled IRD in its lightly armored SUVs, ready to join the military in engaging local leaders in dialogue. Stability requires the trust of the host community. Trust is about winning the hearts and minds of the local population. Distrust is endemic in, in unstable environments, so modeling accountability by your words and deeds is by far the most important aspect of trust building. Beginning from the first engagement, we must deliver on our promises and expect and help our host country residents and officials to do the same. Security is always a major concern in fragile areas, with open warfare always just around the corner. You can't develop your way to security, a PRT commander told me, describing the challenge of pushing a road into an insecure area of Afghanistan. One of our leaders was uh, in a convoy that where an IED uh, exploded and he got a uh, call from uh, Ambassador Eikenberry in Afghanistan. And our, uh, our leader, uh, IRD leader, uh, probably responded, get the hell off the telephone. Why would I, I, Ambassador Eikenberry be telephoning me? 
So after three or four uh, exchanges like this, the ambassador was able to uh, convince him that he really was <laughs> concerned about him and that he was, really was the ambassador. Uh, but it does give an example of how the fragile relationship is in terms of stability and how important it is to have open dialogue with all the leaders uh, on the same page. Programs should plan for and attempt to reduce risks in communities, work areas, project sites, and field visits, and build the key relationships to the local power structure that are so vital to our personal safety and our development objectives. It is important to keep lines of communication open to the military and police leadership and outside security forces. The international NGO has an important role in being an honest broker building lines of communication between community leaders, program leaders, local political leaders, the police, national government ministries and officials, and military leaders. Civilian-led stabilization programming is vulnerable to being sidelined or marginalized by several different uh, actors, the military, foreign policy institutions, local communities, local governments, national governments, and international donors. Too often, these policymakers or military leaders are not familiar with the life cycle of stabilization and development programs and are often frustrated with the speed, pace, or direction of programming on the ground. Policy changes can happen very quickly and interrupt programs that are underway. And there are many actors involved in this situation. And it's very important that they keep uh, working together in the same direction. And problems come when different actors and, uh, go in different directions. But it is important to recognize that stability programs are intended to provide stability from both a military and security standpoint and, st and stability to vulnerable populations needing access to health care, sanitation services, water, food, and an ability to learn, earn a livelihood for your families. Stability and reconstruction initiatives need to be large, significant, and strategic to show immediate results and improvement in living conditions. This might be in the form of electrical power restored to a community or the extension of electrical power to a village that has never had electricity before. Or it might be in the form of the distribution of seeds to farmers to cultivate or in the form of agricultural implements or the rehabilitation of irrigation ditches that have been destroyed by conflict. Civil society is strengthened when underrepresented groups, women, ethnic groups, minorities, geographically isolated villagers, and others are invited to become partners in building a new society. And it may be in the form of giving legitimacy to local, regional, and national government structures who are seeking effectiveness and recognition. Jobs and employment need to be generated quickly. Some of the most effective stabilization and reconstruction tools come in the form of training, upgrading the skills of a workforce that is desperately yearning to get back into economic activity. This can often be done under the auspices of a government agricultural ministry or decentralized outreach project. IRD has learned that the more we build our stability and reconstruction programs around a common long-term community, provincial, and or national development plan, the more successful we will be as conflict areas move from instability to stability and on to successful development. In Serbia, the Jinjic government, when it came into, into play, had a very clear policy of privatization. It had an EU focus. It strengthened local governments and it decentralized a lot of powers and it was committed to a market economy. 
So in that regard, the programs we did in Serbia sped up that process, and major economic and social growth resulted. And as you know, in Afghanistan, a major challenge is for the U.S. policy and the Karzai government to be working on the same page. Ministries have to be aligned together with stabilization programs for stable post-conflict stability. Stabilization programs must be flexible, nimble, and adaptable. The ability to respond quickly with targeted programming is crucial, but it is even more important to be ready to adapt rapidly to the host community's working and living environment. Program results must be prioritized, documented, and communicated. High levels of funding injected into small areas naturally increase the visibility and expectations that come with stability operations and may be followed by high levels of mistrust, criticism, and, and media scrutiny. We must insist that our programs model accountability, invest in strong documentation systems, and build robust communications plans targeting beneficiaries, donors, and stakeholders. We also, in the, from the in NGO perspective and people involved in stability, we have to stay close to our donors because they drive the process and they also make changes when we were working in Afghanistan, there was a lion of a man named Richard Holbrook, who was uh, very involved in major decisions. I can remember very clearly uh, how he took an interest in our Avipa program, which was an agricultural program, which was distributing seeds uh, to farmers uh, in the north and wanted to move it into the south to become part of the counterinsurgency. On the July 4th, of 2007, I got a phone call from Kabul and said, we really appreciate this program. We want to move it in. The Marines are going into Hellman. We want you there quickly, and we're adding $300 million to your agreement. Boom. Get to work. We're watching. So the donor is very important and very much a key actor of this whole process. Monitoring and evaluation, of course, needs to be a priority from the start and throughout implementation. It is important to measure program achievements against plans and continuously monitor results and make changes as necessary. That is, being flexible, nimble, and adaptable. Detailed M&E plans before startup must prioritize hiring and training local qualified staff. The most successful programs welcome independent evaluation and measurement from and in collaboration with outside experts. And as we all know, every large stabilization program in a conflict zone will be audited and usually by multiple agents. In closing, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's conference. I know I speak on behalf of IRD's 3,000 plus employees around the developing world who look forward to hearing about the co this conference and our expert discussions. I hope we can work together collaboratively to take the lessons we discuss here today and try to help and make an impact in future programs for the benefit of those vulnerable populations who need and indeed depend on our effective support. I'd like to thank our participants from various sectors, from host country representatives, U.S. government officials, for-profit development firms, and international NGOs. This conference is really a testament to how important they feel this topic is. I think we all stand unified in our goal of developing peaceful, stable, and effective transitions in conflict environments so that economic, social, and political development can take root, helping vulnerable populations to succeed and flourish. In summary, General Petraeus recently noted that shedding our capacities and capabilities for stability operations will not make the need for those capabilities disappear. 
All future operations will continue to include some mix of offense, defense, and stabilization, and most will be comprehensive civil military endeavors, requiring us to employ every tool in our diplomatic, economic, and defense arsenals. Development has always been the weaker institution at the conflict table. Nevertheless, it must be elevated and supported or the other institutions risk diminishing their own effectiveness and success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Art, for your very kind words, and uh, to uh, John and to, uh, and to Robert for uh, inviting us to participate and inviting us to, uh, to sponsor this event. On behalf of ACOM, I want to uh, welcome uh, our distinguished guests, uh, as well as everyone who's participated. Uh, there was some discussion early on, I guess, about uh, the topic of stabilization and whether it was still relevant, and judging by the participation, I would say it is indeed very relevant. Uh, you know, on behalf of ACOM, we're, uh, you know, very excited to be here and sponsoring this event, but also very uh, happy to participate with, uh, with IRD. Some of you may or may not know we, uh, we do have a fairly uh, close collaboration uh, uh, across uh, a number of programs uh, in, in, in a number of different countries, and uh, we enjoy a very close collaboration uh, in that regard. We view stabilization as really a, a, almost a, a, an emerging, if not kind of here to stay uh, activity uh, in the development framework. Um, it's, uh, it's unfortunately becoming an increasingly more prominent uh, activity in a lot of the programs that we see around the world. And as a result, um, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, a, a, unfortunately a sort of trend, whether it's through our OTI programs, Office of Transition Initiative with USAID, or just uh, straight up uh, stabilization activities, whether it be in Afghanistan or, or elsewhere around the world. And I think it's important to echo, I think, John's earlier comments uh, about, uh, you know, old wine, new bottles, if you will. This, this is not a new thing for the United States government or the United States foreign security apparatus to contend with. But I think it certainly bears worth a careful analysis as we begin to embark on, on the next phase, if you will. Uh, because of the relevance of uh, the, uh, the lessons learned over the last uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 years. Uh, it's not even that, quite frankly. I think if, if anybody who's a, a student of this particular arena or this particular uh, uh, paradigm, if you will, within the development context, whether it's Beirut in the early 90s, late 80s, whether it's Central America, uh, or even going back to you know, the Vietnam you know, Hamlet evaluation system, I mean, there's a tremendous body of data that's out there. Uh, for us to look at uh, as, as development practitioners and as, as folks who, who participate in, in, in foreign security operations. And I think it, it certainly is more relevant today than ever uh, as, we, as we begin to see a pullback, if you will, of, um, of the military uh, sort of hard power aspect of things and, and the resurgence of soft power. And I think we really do need to look at the tools and, and the lessons learned, if you will. So as, as far as we're concerned from ACOM's perspective, we think the relevance of this, this conference at this particular juncture is, 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 is paramount, quite frankly, in the discussion. And I think as we were just chatting earlier on this morning, uh, as, as many folks are sort of running away, if you will, from this discussion, I think it's very important for us to, to remain engaged and remain uh, committed to, 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 to the debate and the discussion and, and, and finding out, you know, again, lessons learned and what works and what doesn't work. So on behalf of AACOM, I want to thank you and, and welcome everyone. And in the interest of time, I think we'll, uh, we'll just uh, hand things over to Robert and get things underway. So thank you very much.